Cooperation and the exchange of cyber information are top priorities for both government and industry. But they're also locked in fierce competition for talent. The head of U.S. Army Cyber Command says his office has at least one big advantage in the tug of war for human capital. I discussed culture with Lieutenant General Paul Nakasone at RSA. So when we think of cyber culture, think of it as a movement from compliance to mission assurance. How important is the network to us? It's critically important. And so when we start to think about cyber culture, we think in terms of the changes to people, the changes to processes, the changes to partnerships. Mm -hmm. So let's start with the people. How does cyber culture apply in the people domain in your office? Also think about the all. So we have an intent to touch everyone within the Army in terms of cybersecurity. How do we teach them? How do we educate them? How do we make them more aware of this new domain? Then we think about the many, and the many for me are commanders, because commanders drive change. They're the ones that can ensure that their units are looking at cybersecurity differently. And then we think of the few. For us, the few are roughly the 2,000 men and women, military, civilian, that operate on our cyber teams. How do we assess? How do we recruit? How do we train? How do we retain that force? Has the biggest cyber culture challenge for your team been getting the many and the all to understand that they're also cyber professionals? So I think the um, biggest opportunity for us is to think about this throughout our army active, reserve, men, women. It's the idea that everyone is an operator in this space. So whether or not you're in the cyber force, or you're operating a computer, or you're doing information technology work, you each have a responsibility to this. And the ability to ensure that the all are working towards the end state is critically important. I think there's a perception that in a military environment, the processes may be the easiest of the three, because you can just give an order to your uniform people and they're supposed to carry it out. That's probably not if how it works. It was only that easy, Francis. <laughs> uh, so change begins with an idea that germinates that is maybe top down or even bottom up fed. What I would tell you though is that the processes, whether or not it's the process for acquisition or it's the processes for retaining or retaining people or it's the processes for bringing people into the Army, all of these have been addressed as we take a look at culture change. How's change management different though in an environment where some of your people will have to do exactly what you tell them when you tell them to do it in a certain way, the uniform folks, and the civilians don't it, the same thing doesn't apply. So the nice thing is we have one standard. That's a joint standard that permeates our entire force. So whether or not you're Army, Navy, Air Force, Marines, whether or not you're military, civilian, contractor, you have to make that joint standard. And that joint standard is driven by U.S. Cyber Command, the Department of Defense, and that's critical for us to having one idea upon which we move forward. And culturally, that strikes me as incredibly important because if you're building a cyber culture that drives a certain way in the Army and you have a case at some point in time where you're interacting with your counterparts in the other branches and Cyber Command and kinetic warfighters and so on, you're really going to be in a hole. So this is what we learned from the Special Operations Forces, that having a joint standard is extremely powerful. I'm a Joint Force Commander, and so when I receive Marine, Air Force, Navy teams, I have the confidence, the assurance that they have one training standard to operate, whether or not it's offensively or defensively or defending and operating our networks, that they're going to be trained to that one standard. What is the thing that you need the most, the skill or the number of people or the specialty or something like that that yes. you need the most right now? Yes, we need all of that. So we need, uh, we need both uh, capacity but also capability. It, it does begin with the people aspect of it. As we talked about earlier, if you think about people, processes, and partnerships, there's a reason why people are first. So being able to first of all assess, being able to recruit, being able to train, and then the important thing is how do we retain the best? Maybe not all, but the best that's so important to us. The Vice Chief of the Army joined the other Vice Chiefs and Vice Commandant of the Marine Corps on the Hill a couple of weeks back. Message number one was readiness, message number two was readiness, and message number three was readiness. How does readiness, the concept, apply to what you're doing, not just culturally, but capability-wise at Cyber Command? Incredibly important for us to have the narrative of readiness. That is the Secretary of Defense's number one priority, Secretary of the Army's, Chief of Staff of the Army, certainly down to Army Cyber Command. What we need to do is to be able to describe our networks in terms of are they ready? Our offensive teams, are they ready? Our defensive teams, are they ready? Do we have a platform that's 
markets ready, accessible, assured, capable. Mm -hmm. How does some of the budget uncertainty that each of those vice chiefs talked about impact the cyber realm and impact the readiness in the cyber realm? So incredibly, uh, incredibly impactful to what we're doing. If you think about uh, sequestration, the Budget Control Act, as we think about a few years ago when sequestration actually hit our civilian workforce laid off and and, uh, and not working for a period of time, very, very difficult as you think about how are you going to be able to actually recruit and convince people to stay within this force when that uncertainty still hangs over their heads. General, what do you, how do you see the culture of your force in uh, Army Cyber Command and your colleagues in the other branches moving forward or evolving in the coming years? Threats will change, obviously. Technological capabilities will change. The demands that the uh, threats across the world will uh, put on the force will change. How do you plan, how do you strategize to respond to that? So I think what's uh very, very helpful is that all of the services have realized that they have to step forward in terms of being able to operate within cyberspace. And I think the capabilities, as you say, will improve. I think that our adversaries will also improve. But the thing that will be foundational for our success will be the people. And so how do we actually recruit this force? How do we actually train this force? And at the end of the day, how do we encourage our best people to stay within this force? And to wrap up, that's where I want to go. The retention is maybe as important or maybe more important than the recruiting in the first place when there are lots of distractions potentially in the form of private sector companies like a lot of those folks here at RSA that would love to take the training, take advantage of the training that you've given these folks. How do you keep them in? How do we keep them in? We keep them in with a great mission, with great leadership, great opportunities for the future. I think that's where we take a look at the future and we say we have a competitive advantage there. No one can do in this space what we're doing today because we have such a unique mission. That's the defense of our nation. It's a great selling point. General Nakasone, thanks very much for your Thank time. Thank you very much, Francis.